there's nothing wrong. Nothing is wrong right now in your life. I have spent much time experiencing very high highs and very low lows. And what Alcoholics Anonymous did for me is it made me realize that my happiness should not be dependent on my circumstances. My happiness should be dependent on the functioning, my functioning in the world as a channel for a power greater than myself. And as I've surrendered to this higher power in troubles and in no troubles, my problems have become ladders to new vistas. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Bienvenidos, mi amigas and mi amigos. That was the voice of Mr. Matthew M. Once again, that you heard at the beginning of this episode, and you are fortunate enough that you will be hearing so much more from him in just a moment. But first things First, this episode is brought to you by Miss Tanya. You know what Tanya did? Tanya went to our website, SoberSpeak.com. She clicked on the little yellow PayPal donate tab and made a contribution. Thank you so much, Tanya, for your generosity. This episode is coming right out to you. I, John M., will be the chairperson for this meeting between meetings. And I am truly honored and privileged to serve all of you listening in. So take a seat, if you will, around this virtual table and let's get started. This is Sober Speak, a meeting between meetings at your fingertips. Let's see how long I go with that. I kind of like it. Nonetheless, as a reminder, you can find us, if you are wondering, on Apple Podcasts, formerly known as iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, TuneIn, or wherever else you listen to your podcast. If you can't remember any of that, simply go to our website, www.soberspeak.com, and there are links to all of the aforementioned on the website and you can just click on it and get there. If you don't really like getting on the internet or you just have your phone, your device, your smartphone, and you want to text the word sober, S O B E R to three, one, nine, nine, six. Once again, you text the word sober S O B E R to three, one, nine, nine, six. And there you will get a chance to both sign up for our uh, email list that we have. And also you will get a chance to click on either a iTunes or a Google podcast link, and you can subscribe to the pod from that location. All right. I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, listener feedback, kind of listener feedback, kind of posting actually on the front of this because we have so much listener feedback on the end. So I'm going to uh, break it up here this time. So I found this on iTunes or Apple Podcasts and Barry posted on Apple Podcasts. And the title of this says, Brilliant! Exclamation point. And he says, Wonderful podcast. Keep 
going, John M. Londonberry. Well, Londonberry, thank you for posting that uh, on Apple Podcasts. I sure do appreciate it. And he actually gave me a little bit of a five-star rating there. I'm so thankful uh, when people do that. All right. Another one that we had out there, I guess you don't call this a post. This is more of a, uh, a review. That's what it is. Yes, that is the word, review. We got another review on... Uh, Apple Podcasts, and it says, many thanks. Thank you for your service. I listen to an episode each day, especially throughout the lockdown. I'm 11 months and two weeks clean and sober and consider this podcast as a friend in my pocket. <laughs> Well, well, you're getting a little personal there, <laughs> sir, ma'am. I, I don't know. Anyway, I don't have a name. I could tell it came from Great Britain, it says. Uh, oh, it says Greg. Greg TDK 100 via Apple Podcast. So, Greg, I am... <laughs> I am thrilled to be a friend in your pocket. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for the post. Oh, my mind's going all over the place. Nonetheless, Jen posted in the secret Facebook group. She says, John, I just actually it doesn't say John. She was posting this to everybody. It says, I just want to say how grateful I am for this group in the secret Facebook group and this podcast. Getting to meetings has definitely been challenging. I feel like after listening to an episode, I have been, quote, reset, unquote, like I just walked out of a meeting I hope all of you are having a wonderful day. And she got, Jen got all sorts of posts and comments on that. And Jen, I really do appreciate you posting that in the secret Facebook group. And here is another, it's always hard for me to choose in the secret Facebook group what I'm going to share on air. I mean, there are just so many posts, but uh, this one really resonated with me this week. And Rob posted in the Facebook group. He says, hello, everyone. I'm Rob and I'm an alcoholic. I am new to this group and my sobriety date is today. I had my last relapse last night, but I'm fully ready, willing, and have the desire to never drink again. I have lost my beautiful girlfriend and also most of my family's trust. And this is my last chance to prove I can stay sober or I will be on the streets. I pray to God I am able to find the serenity and peace I need to live a life of sobriety and experience happiness and joy without the claws of alcohol and drinking suffocating me any longer. God bless everyone here, and I thank you in advance for your time and reading my post. And Rob just was able to receive tons of feedback, comments, likes, just a lot of sharing that went on in that from that post. And I just wanted to say thank you for sharing that, Rob. My prayers are with you. And if you're listening to this out there and you have a moment to stop and share a prayer for Mr. Rob, it would be most appreciated. All right. Now, on to Mr. Matthew M. Part two, and this is called the name of the episode or the title of this episode is That's Grace. And Matthew said that that's grace a couple of times on the previous episode. And if you didn't hear Matthew M. Part one, that's grace. I would highly, highly recommend that you go back and listen to that episode as well. But as I mentioned at the previous, uh, at the end of the previous episode with Matthew, Matthew's going to, in this episode, address life after getting sober. Um, he talks about his newfound relationship with the mother of his daughter, her parents, and his daughter herself, Phoebe Rose. He discusses his new family um, that he was blessed with as he got, as he was able to get married when his daughter was two years old and the loving relationship that he has with his new wife and their children is an absolutely beautiful story. Matthew talks about coming out of rehab, 
Uh, and he also talks about his encounter with Rotten Ron. <laughs> Don't you love the names that we give each other <laughs> in Alcoholics Anonymous? Rotten Ron. And employment came to Matthew through Alcoholics Anonymous. That is an incredible story you don't want to miss. And uh, Matthew talks about his wife and the stroke that she had and the disability that she deals with through today because of that stroke. And uh, it is quite a love story. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is just the tip of the iceberg. Please enjoy this. Once again, we shall have plenty Oh. And that is always for my Irish friends out there. Plenty of oh, listener feedback at the end of this episode. Enjoy. Okay, everybody. So we are back, fortunately, once again with Mr. Matthew M. So, Mr. <laughs> Matthew M., I am going to ask you to once again introduce yourself, give your sobriety date if you wish, tell the people where you live in this great land of ours, and then we'll get cranked up again. Okay, John. Uh, my name is Matthew. I live in Santa Paula, California, and my sobriety date is May 16th, 1993. So last time we were with Mr. Matthew, uh, he was, well, he basically just went through his entire what it was like, what he was like before he got to Alcoholics Anonymous. And then we kind of stopped at the point where Matthew was coming out of rehab. So, Mr. Matthew, I think I'm going to turn it over to you from there and let you talk about a little bit what it was like from that point moving forward. Uh, thanks, John. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, that was um, so middle of June 1993, I, um, 30 days uh, in, in a facility. And it was funny. I um I checked in at 108 pounds and I gained 47 pounds. I know that because they weigh you on the way in <laughs> and they weigh wow. you on the way out. So you gained 47 pounds in 30, in 30 days? days. Yeah. And I I um it's funny because I I make a note of that because that's almost all I remember of that experience because <laughs> I, I had an old timer said to me. Not to me. Anybody who shares at a meeting is speaking directly to me. And he was sharing, you know, <laughs> a year or so into my recovery. And he said his, his name was Rotten Ron. He's passed away, but he had a toothpick in his mouth. And he said, you know, you come in here going about 90 miles an hour. You're going to skid for a while. <laughs> and so I think I did a lot of my high speed skidding in the rehab facility I was in. Or the, I don't know what they would call it. It's not, but uh, my brother picked me up. Uh, my brother 12 stepped me and he was tired. His AA group had had a, a big party out there in Palm Springs is where I was. And he was tired and he let me drive, which you have to understand that there wasn't the usual thing for my brother to do. Let me drive his car. So I was already like, wow. 30 days of recovery and I can have all these new privileges. We, he had driven to the gas station and then he said, Hey, why don't you drive home? And we drove home and he slept um, the whole way and we pulled up in front of my apartment and, and he said, you know, you need to go to a meeting. And I remember thinking he was crazy. It's like, you know, I've, I've just got 30 days. I have a brand new child. My mother's really terminally ill and I haven't seen her visited her and, I have to get a job and I have to do my laundry and I have to clean my apartment. And he said, go to a meeting, but I'm a liar. And I lied and said, yeah, that's, of course, that's what I was going to do. <laughs> and I had no, no uh, inclination to go to an AA meeting on that day. I just got out of 30 days in rehab. The funny part of that story is a couple of years later, my brother told me, you know, I just pretended to sleep on the way back because just between the rehab and the gas station, you were so full of newcomer BS. I could hardly <laughs> stand listening to you. You were like, oh my God, I worked the fist up. I'm going to be the greatest father ever. And, you know, I'm going to cure cancer and I, you know, sobriety, hey, hey, 12 steps. And he said, I could, I could take, couldn't take it. And, and I know what happened. I was afraid. I, I have never been more afraid of my, there are two scariest days of my life. One was walking into that place and the other was walking out. And I was coming out of my skin and my brother just said, you drive and leaned against the, his car door and closed his eyes. So I'd stop talking. <laughs> and, and, 
it, the funny thing is I ended up not lying to my brother. Again, I talked before last time we talked about grace and you never know what's setting the wheels of motion of, of grace in motion. And my brother, I got out of his car and he said, go to a meeting. And I walked up to my apartment and I opened the door and somebody handed me a beer. And I, I used to joke about that. It wasn't a beer. It was a Coors. <laughs> so there wasn't a whole lot of danger there, but I, I <laughs> but the truth is, you know, I, I walk into this apartment and there's people snorting cocaine in there. There's girls in bikinis. There's marijuana smoke in the air. There's tons of alcohol. And I left that apartment. I lived there by myself and no one had been there to visit me in months, you know, but now they found out that I was gone and they broke into my apartment and had oh, a my goodness. big party. Yeah. And, and so I talked a little bit about it last time we, we met, but a funny thing happened, and, and if you're listening to this and you're in your first year of recovery, I want to be really clear about what happened because I don't want to give the impression that I had a lot of willpower or that I had a, a phone foundation of recovery from, from rehab for 30 days. What happened in that second when I was standing on my own porch with a beer in my hand looking into this party was... I had a, a singular thought that came into my mind, and I believe that's grace. I actually practice the 11 step very intensely, and I know how my mind works, and I don't think the appropriate thought at the appropriate time. Thoughts come into my mind, and I some of them catch my attention and some don't. But I was standing there, and this person handed me a beer, and the thought that came into my head was, Matthew, you have nothing. You don't have character or self-respect. You have no prospects. There's no way you're going to ever get out of debt. You're going to have no way to be employed at the level of employment that would match your education. But you have 30 days. And are you going to give away the one thing you've got to these losers again? And I don't know where that thought came from, but it was strong enough for me to put that beer down and run to a, uh, to a pay phone and call AA. And I called AA, uh, and the poor guy that answered the phone, I told him almost everything I told you last time we've talked. You know, rock star, baby, cancer, blah, you, know, like, you got to help, of course. You know, I was just a mess. And uh, I thought he was going to help me. And he, I heard him flipping through these papers on the phone, and he said, oh, my God. He said, where are you? And I said, I'm on the corner of Burl and whatever in Redondo Beach. And he said, oh, my God there's a meeting right across the street from where you're standing and it starts in 15 minutes. And he said, I said, actually, I, I actually said to him, so what do you think I should do? <laughs> because <laughs> that's awesome. But I just explained that I have real problems, you know, send real, a car yeah. and a therapist and a bottle of water and, you know, and he said, you know, astonished with me, he said, go to the meeting. And I did. I, I, it took me a while, honestly, to walk in. I walked around the block. I was afraid. And I went in there and um, everything changed. You know, I mean, everything changed. And uh, I didn't lie to my brother. I went to a meeting that day. And on my way out, um, one of my brother's friends were there. And he actually said, wow, I heard you look terrible. He actually said it in a much more street language way. <laughs> and I said, well, that was 30 days ago. I've been doing a lot of work on myself, <laughs> which really meant I've been sleeping and eating like regular people do at appropriate right. times. You know? <laughs> and he uh, he's offered to give me a ride home. And I had run to the meeting, you know, literally. So I said, that'd be great. And and we I couldn't get in his car. I kept hesitating. I was walking slower out to the parking lot. And he finally turned on me and said, uh, what's your issue here? What's your problem? And I said, I don't think I can go home. And and you have to understand, my brother belonged to the Treasure Group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Southern California. And they're real hardcore, you know, come early, stay late, be of service. And and they were tight. And my parent, my mother was dying of cancer. And my brother was somebody important in that group. So the guy said to me, you can't go home. I told him about my apartment and he said, but where do your, don't your parents live near here? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I'll take you there. And I'm like, no, man, you're not going to take me there. You know? And, and the important lesson for me years later, looking back on this was I had my perception of what that was going to be like, right? Mm -hmm. It was going to be humiliating for them really bad. My mom's dying of cancer. They're married at that time to each other for 45 years. 
they're madly in love with each other. My dad is beside himself with fear of losing her. And they don't need a kid who's 31 years old, fresh out of rehab, showing up and sleeping at their house. I, I just couldn't imagine the humility and the shame. And also for me, it was going to be terrible. It couldn't be worse. I can't get sober in that kind of environment, you know, at my parents' house with my mother sick. And so that was my perception. But fortunately, my brother's group had were good and they had worked on my parents' house while my while my dad mom was sick and he knew where my mother lived, my parents lived. And and fortunately also, we don't listen to newcomers. And <laughs> he drove me to my parents' house, no matter what my protestations were. And and I didn't have any choice but to walk up and um, to the door because there were, you know, he dropped me off. I lived in a suburb of Los Angeles. It's like Dallas. You know, there's all there were were other parents' houses in my area, right? So I walked up to the steps and I was, uh, I talk about grace a lot. And there was grace because there was on the porch, there was a guitar pick of mine and I hadn't been there in a long time. And my dad was a fairly fastidious World War II vet. Things were neat and clean. And my mother, who was very ill at the time, kept a good house. And I was mesmerized after I rang the doorbell by that guitar pick. I, I had no idea how it could still be there. And I just think it kept me there long enough. Um, my parents are from Illinois. They're from the Midwest. And they answer the phone together. And they showed up. And my mom was strapped to this oxygen and they opened the door and I said, I need your help. And they were so happy to see me. The gladness just came out of them. And um, I'm a parent now. I have uh, four children. I have three uh, biological children and an adopted daughter. And, and uh, I know my favorite sentence is, can you help me? Mm -hmm. I just, my perception couldn't have been farther from the truth. I, I had no idea that they were laying awake at night worrying about me, that this was the answer to their prayers. I could not have known that. And I thought this is going to be horrible for me. And, and, it, and in a way it was. I mean, I went back to my old bedroom. I joke about this, but it's true. The only remnant of my staying there was a life-size poster of Eric Clapton on the wall. And uh, I said, I'm back, Eric, you know, and uh, <laughs> we, and I went in there and honestly, I woke up the next day like, holy God, I'm at my parents' house. And I had a, a meeting directory from the one meeting I'd been to the night before. And I went up to my dad at breakfast and said, hey, can I borrow the car? I have a, a – there's a meeting at 7 a.m. and I'd like to go. And he said, don't even ask me. Just if, if you're going to AA, just, just go. So I just left there to get away from them. And, and I did that three times a day. For a long time, I was so uncomfortable. I'd go to them to an AA meeting. You guys would make me uncomfortable. So I'd come home. Then about noon, I'd be coming out of my skin. And, you know, and nobody was victimizing me. My, you know, my parents were like, they had so many things they could have held my feet to the fire about. And they just loved me. And, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll give you a chance to ask a question in a second. But one of the things that was a real sign that, first of all, there is a power greater than me. And secondly, that I was getting well as I started really loving being at the AA meetings and I couldn't wait to get home to my parents. Mm. And I don't know, I didn't make that happen. I just, my feet went and my dad's car went to a lot of meetings, you know, and, and I, and I sometimes tell newcomers like, stop waiting to get it, let it happen. You know, just be at the place where it happens. So, uh... I am interested in, and I'm not sure where this is coming up in your story, but you know, w we talked about this last time we were together, but your, your relationship with uh, your daughter who was born uh, on or the day after your sobriety day and the mother of that child. So what, how did that relationship play out throughout sobriety? Uh, okay, so that's a great question, and and it really started um, to improve pretty quickly. I got um, sorry, I got to shake this drink. Um, I got a uh, eventually in about uh, two or three months, my sponsor was driving me to meetings because I didn't have a car that was reliable, and uh, we were maybe sixty ninety days. I don't. It was around sixty or ninety days. I remember I was walking into a meeting with him telling them how much I love Phoebe and telling them how 
I thought it was the worst thing to have this baby. And it turned out it was the greatest thing. And, you know, I, I didn't realize that being an AA, I, I so embraced being a father and, and he didn't really pay any attention. And he went into the meeting. And when we came out of the meeting, he, I was walking to the parking lot with him and he turned to me and he put his hand up when I was continuing how I love my daughter speech. And he said, can you just stop it, please? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, how much child support do you pay? And I said, well, I, you know, I work at a newspaper at night, stacking newspapers into a loading dock. And I deliver packages during the day in between meetings. And I live at my mom and my dad's house. And he said, yeah, I know your circumstances. I just don't know how much child support you're paying. And I said, well, I'm not paying any. And he goes, then stop telling me you love your daughter. And I realized very quickly I, I needed a new sponsor and probably a new home group and <laughs> that these people were callous and cold and heartless. And uh, what happened when we got home from our very quiet drive <laughs> is that I, uh, I realized my face was red because he was right. And I called up, um, called up Anna and said, you know, I should give you some money. And she, she's a very smart woman, actually very good mother too. And I called her and said, you know, I don't have much. And she said, well, no, let's just do a percentage of your paycheck, right? So as time went on and I did better, they did better too. But I paid her and I had to pay her every two weeks for a while because, you know, I uh, had no bank account, no bank in the world. You know, they got those damn things called computers and they could all talk to each other <laughs> and they figured out I was a really bad risk. So I had to go to those lame <laughs> check cashing places. And, but what was interesting, a, a couple things happened is every two weeks I'd go over there and pay the money and play with Phoebe. Right. And I could hold my head up somewhat. I'm going to this, you know, not, you know, she wasn't 17. She was 18, 19. And I was like going over there paying the money and, and I could walk by her parents and play with my daughter. And, and by the way, her parents were lovely, always kind. And they didn't need to be. I actually thank them for their example of Christianity um, before they passed away. They were always kind to me. But I would go there every two weeks and, and about a year in, they were going to, Anna was going to go off to college and I was playing with Phoebe and I was thinking, telling Phoebe, you know, who can't talk. She's just so happy to see me. She used to light up and, and John, I don't know if you remember what your bottom was like, but not a lot of people lit up when they saw me. <laughs> it was more like, oh, there's that douchebag that stole from me or whatever. Right. <laughs> and, and, and it, Phoebe had no agenda. Like she looked at me like, here's the nice man that brings money and likes to play. And mm -hmm. we love hanging out. And I was playing with her thinking, saying to her, you know, I'm going to take you to your first day of kindergarten and I'm going to take you to your first day of first grade. And uh, I'm going to buy you a car when you're 16. I can't really buy one for myself, but somehow I'm going to figure out how to get one for you. And, uh, and I'll try to get you to college. And um and that, the reason that's so important to me is a year before that, I met those two people. And my immediate response was, I need to check out. I need to wipe myself off the face of this earth. And it, because I got introduced to Alcoholics Anonymous, and because my group was not interested in anything that I thought, but they were enthusiastically interested in things that I was doing. I was able to realize the joy that I would know this person till I died and the privilege and the, the gift of it. And so when I said all those things to Phoebe, that is a, a transformation brought about entirely by the steps of AA and, and, the, and the fellowship and, and the, the honesty and transparency that's engendered from the relationship with a sponsor that really doesn't judge you. You know, my sponsor doesn't judge me. He loves me. He helps me and he directs me. Um, but anyway, uh, I did. I took her to her first day of kindergarten and uh, first day of first grade. I cried like a baby. First day of oh. second second grade, cried like a baby. I think it was sixth grade where she stopped me and said, Dad, uh, <laughs> we're not going to do that today. You're a little hard to explain. <laughs> and Phoebe is brilliant. She has an incredible IQ. And um I did buy her a car when she was 16 with her mother, you know, and her mother and I put her through college and we just finished paying for nursing school. And Phoebe is an RN uh, who works with the mentally ill. And I couldn't be prouder of her. And um, 
she uh, is getting married and asked me to walk her down the aisle. And her mother and I both got married when she was about two, two and a half. Mm -hmm. And um, she's grown up in two pretty loving households. So that leads me to the next question. I have heard you mention your wife and your other children. Talk to me a little bit about that and, you know, how that came about and what that experience has been like in sobriety. So I, thank you. Yeah. So in the background of all of these things happening, I'm going to a lot of meetings I eventually, um, I, well, I hadn't moved out of my parents' house at the point where you want me to talk about, but I'm really listening to people in AA tell the truth. Like I went to a step study where you couldn't, you couldn't uh, share unless you'd work the step and you, there were no birthday celebrations. There were fifth step celebrations. So if you did a fifth step, they had a big, it was a big deal and you could talk ah. about it. So I, again, I, I, I could say I was duped by a loving God or I was advanced a bunch of grace that I thought everybody paid every dime back. I thought everybody worked with others. I thought everybody did a fifth step, and which is great because I, I did all those things really, really, really to the best of my ability. I was really, really honest on my first fifth step, and it wasn't until seven years later that I could really talk about how badly I abused Anna. And I don't believe that I lied. I believe I couldn't, I didn't believe it. I, I didn't have it in me to see it. You know, there's a joke a guy used to tell in my group. He said, you do a fifth step when you're a year sober and you stole a bunch of rope. And when you're five years sober, there were a bunch of horses attached to it. <laughs> 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 and, and, and I want to preface what I'm about to tell you with uh, something I heard in a meeting not too long ago. And I've been saying it every chance I get because people need to hear it. I was at a meeting in January up here in Santa Paula where I've adopted a new home group. And a guy, I, I don't know what he does for a living. I think he's a pipe fitter. He's kind of comes to the meeting kind of dirty and a uh, young guy. And he said, what AA taught me is that, you know, when you think about it, life really does suck. <laughs> and he goes, but when you live it, it's really awesome. Mm. And I want to talk about living sober. So I was still living with my mom and my dad and I went to my sponsor and I said, you know, I love that prayer. I've been praying that prayer, relieve me of the bondage of self. And, and I have these terrible jobs. I had, I had better terrible jobs. They got micro, like tiny bit better. I, I went from a loading dock to a gas dock, you know, <laughs> which was nice. I was out in the sun and I like boats, but, um, <laughs> but I'm living with my mom and my dad, and, and I go tell my sponsor before the Hermosa Beach Monday Night Men's Stag meeting that, you know, I, I'm praying the, for the relief of the bondage of self. And I'm sort of an intellectual. I mean, I, I you know, I, I love to read. I'm surrounded by books and guitars here. And, and I could really resonate with that phrase, the bondage of self. You know, when I walk into a room, I have to categorize each person to feel safe. You know, he's okay. You're a loser. That person, why are they wearing that? That's all the bondage of self. You know, if I'm at an AA meeting and I'm listening to a speaker and I'm critiquing the speaker. That's the bondage of self. That's an unbelievable lack of freedom to hear what's happening. So I said to my sponsor, I'm praying this prayer. And he said, well, why don't you help God out? Why don't you relieve yourself of the bondage of self? And, and I, that, I, that made my synapses crash. I was I didn't even know what that means. Like, what, what could that possibly mean? And so I said, well, how would I do that? And he goes, he took his cigar out of his mouth and he said, why don't you do something nice for somebody and don't tell anyone about it, right? And I was pretty new. And my first thought was, well, why would I ever do that? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> there's no payday. And, uh, but I, I listened and I went in and, and we were all talking. And at our meeting, like many meetings, we ask if there's somebody from out of town. And this guy uh, raised his hand and he was from Australia and he was going to be visiting once a month. And he kind of stood out because he was wearing a suit and a tie. And if you live in Southern California, if you wear a suit and a tie, it tells everyone you're not very successful. <laughs> this is the town of, you know, movies and music. And But he had a very nice suit on, very tie, gray haired guy, good looking guy. And he said he's visiting from Australia. And I thought to myself. I'll remember that guy's name if he comes back next month and I will be magically relieved of the bondage of self. <laughs> and uh, he did. He came back four weeks later and I saw him 
And I ran across the room and I said, Kevin, welcome back to the greatest meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in the world. And so glad you came here last month. Really glad you're here today. And, and he said, you remembered my name. And I said, yeah, it must be really hard traveling and visiting AA. I said, I want you to know, we, you know, these guys care about recovery. And he said, that really impresses me. You know, what do you do for a living? And I was like, oh, it's the <coughs> newspapers on a loading dock and <coughs> pour gas in the boats, you know. And I was so embarrassed by my, my jobs. And he took me outside and he said, uh, I'm interested in you. He gave me his business card and he said, come to my office and print out your DMV, wear a suit, and uh, you're going to have to fill out some paperwork. I, I want you to interview at my company. And I looked at his card and he was vice president of an international airline. So I went. Uh, uh, it was like two weeks later and uh, when the appointment was. And I had, a, this is so funny, I had a black suit, I had a great tie, I had a, a great white shirt, and brown hush puppy shoes, you know, because <laughs> I don't, I hadn't needed a suit, you know, we just keep them in case there's a wedding or a wake in an Irish family, and, uh, but I didn't have any shoes, and, and I really, you know, when you're new, you're like, well, nobody will notice that my shoes, <laughs> it was like I had clown shoes on, you know, <laughs> and I went to this beautiful office on Century Boulevard, and, he, and he, I walk in, and he introduces, he, he, first of all, he opens the door, looks at my shoes and starts laughing, right? <laughs> and he's an AA, right? But, uh, and I can't say anything about how I know him. He told me that when you come to my office, you don't say how you know me. And he introduces me to the head of human resources for this international airline. And she is a stunning Japanese Hawaiian woman who I still can picture her floating across the room to me. And she looked at my shoes and her face got very tight right? And believe it or not, I'm actually answering your question. So I, I go into this room, sure that I don't belong. You know, like, why did I even come? And, and his office is right behind her office. And I go into her office and she doesn't ask me a single question. She's looking at my DMV. I was arrested three times for the same DUI, right? And it's all right there. And I never paid a parking ticket ever. You know, they just knew it. And what a jail and a couple places for misunderstandings. And she's looking at all this and, and she's looking at the 11 years that I, you know, went to a party with my guitar. I mean, it isn't like I was Mr. We can't wait to hire you. And she said, hold on just a second. And she went into the other room, and, and I, I will try not to blow out the mic. Through the wall, I hear Kevin yell, he's not going to fly the damn planes. He's going to put people on them. <laughs> and this great Australian accent. And I got very comfortable and relaxed. And, and she came in super nervous, like almost shaking. <laughs> and without a single interview question says, I guess we're going to hire you. Right? And I'm like, damn right. You're going to hire me. And uh, anyhow, uh, to, I got a job, you know, and, and at the point of that is I tried to be altruistic for 15 seconds and it changed my whole life. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, God is list God's waiting. It, my, my take on the overriding theme of Alcoholics Anonymous is first you surrender, then comes the grace, then comes the love. First you surrender to make room, then comes the grace that's always there. And when you're filled with grace, you attract love. And uh, what happened to me was I started going back to my parents' house with my head up high. I had one job and it was regular hours and I had a suit and I had a uh, I had a, um, they paid me to clean my suit. And so I was in good shape, you know, and, and one day on the way to work, I bought a guitar. Uh, I stopped at guitar center and I was paying money back to the many people. I had lots of money to, and I had a good job and I bought a guitar and I went to my airline and, you know, a lot of people didn't talk to me um, at my work because I was hired by the vice president and I didn't go out and drink with him in the evening. And that was fine. I, I'd been the cool guy at work and I always got fired and I was the uncool guy and I couldn't be happier doing my job. And so I walked out to this bus stop with my guitar late at night, about 1030 at night. There, if you're in Los Angeles and you see the D bus, that's the, the bus that takes the employees off away from the airport to the parking lot where their cars are. And, and I had this guitar and I turned to this woman next to me 
who was worked at British Airways. She just happened to be the person standing next to me. And I said, can I show you my new guitar? I just bought this. And she looked at me and said, in a very beautiful British accent, I don't look at strange men's guitars. <laughs> and uh, although I just kind of slipped into an Irish accent, she's not Irish. She <laughs> but we, we, it's my bet. I fly like that accent better. But we got into the bus and, and I thought, oh, that's kind of weird. I felt, you know, like she thought I was hitting on her and I wasn't. I mean, what, why would I hit on somebody? I live with my parents, you know, <laughs> and I'm, and I'm in a, yeah. and then I have a baby and, you know, it's just complicated. So I'm standing there and she's, <laughs> she's, she's pressed against me because it's so crowded and in the bus. And she has a book in her hand called Surprised by Joy by C.S. Lewis. And I just wanted her to calm down. And I said, hey, I've read that book. What do you think? Just for her to realize I'm not, you know, some masher. And she looked up and said, well, I'm, I'm on the fence. Do, do you believe in God? And I said, yeah. And I practically spit on her when I said, you know, God saved my life. <laughs> and, uh, and then I kind of reeled it in because she looked nervous. And she said, well, I don't know if I do believe in God. So I had this conversation with this beautiful woman. And I, I didn't realize how beautiful she was till we started talking. And then I saw her blue eyes and her pale skin and her dark hair. And she's petite. And and I realized, and she had this accent, you know, I'm a huge Beatles fan. So, you know, any British accent. And, and I just felt so calm and so relaxed talking about God with her that when we got off the bus, I said, you know, it would be super nice to have dinner with you and get to know you. Would you like to have dinner with me? And she did not think so. She uh, started telling me, oh, yeah, look at my guitar. And I've read that book. And, you know, I have to wait for this bus. And she was kind of rude. And, and I put my hand up and I said, hey, no, no is a complete answer. Because I had dignity. I had a year and a half of sobriety. I, I love my family. I love my children. And I knew who I was. And, uh, but I was sad and I went home to my dad and, and told him, I think I, 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 he said, tell me about her. And I said, I think, you know, she felt like home. You know, and I was really surprised that I said that to him, but the next day I, I joke about this, you know, I groaned spiritually because I went to work the next day and I didn't tell anyone she was a lesbian. You know, <laughs> it's like nobody's business. Right? <laughs> and I'm only half kidding because, you know, I didn't, I liked me and I felt sad that I'd, made her afraid of me. Um, and I didn't have to put her down or say that that's not putting her down, but say, you know, she's not interested in my gender. It's not me. Right. And I went to the bus stop that night and I made every effort to get a bus. She would not get, I went to an earlier bus. I had seen her at her airline and she came up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder. And she said, I, I think I was rude to you. I don't want to go out with you. And I said, well, you've been very clear <laughs> about that. And she said, but I'll, I'll miss this bus and have coffee with you. And uh, we did. And tw about 17 days later, it was two and a half weeks later, she proposed to me and, and she's sleeping right behind me in this room. We've been married for 25 years. Wow. She's right there. Hmm. And we had the most like storybook. We, we could travel anywhere we wanted. We worked at the same place. My parents loved her. My mother lived to see us get married. Uh, we had a little boy named Rory. And when we showed up at the hospital, the only people waiting for us were Phoebe and Anna. Hmm. And the, you know, my mother died in my arms. Um, and I was a son. I had taken care of her with my family the last part of her life. And Phoebe and Anna sat next to each other at the funeral while I played music. And then we had Sophie. Um, Philip and I went and had to the to the hospital and had Sophie and again, Phoebe and Anna and Bill and Jay and everybody came. And then uh, about five years in, I came, I walked back in the house. I was taking the kids out to the park and I walked back in the house and Philip was having a massive stroke, like incredibly damaging stroke. She's paralyzed completely on her left side and she can't trust her thinking or her memory. And uh, I found her there. I'm about seven years sober, a little more than that, a little more than that. And uh, I don't know what to do. And I got him to uh, call an ambulance. I walked right out the door. I had a one-year-old or one-and-a-half-year-old and a, a four-year-old and an eight-year-old, and I just left them. 
he got in the ambulance and, and the neighbors saw the emergency vehicles and they, they swooped up my children. And in the ambulance, I called Bill. Oh, no, I didn't call Bill. I called my sister and I called her parents in the UK. And we went to the local hospital and the idea was that we were going to, they were going to try this thing on her and it didn't work. Uh, so they airlifted her to another hospital. And uh, I, I had called somebody from that hospital. And when I came out, they did try to another operation there that didn't work. And it was pretty likely she wasn't going to make it or that she would never walk. And I walked out into the, the waiting room at like two in the morning and there was a bunch of people from AA. And what they told me without saying anything was that you're not alone. And five minutes before that, I had felt more alone than I'd ever felt. So I called Bill at about four in the morning and was talking to him about it. I woke him up. And he said, I want you to call Jay. And I said, I don't want to call Jay. And he said, I want you to call Jay. And I said, all right, uh, you want me to call Jay at four in the morning? I'll call Jay. And I called Jay and he said, I want, I told him what happened. He said, I want you to talk to my wife, Adele. And now I'm mad. I don't want to talk to Adele. I want to talk to Bill, you know. And he puts Adele on the phone and she says, darling, I've had five strokes. Let me tell you what your wife's feeling right now. And that's what I love about Alcoholics Anonymous is I get experience here. I don't get opinions. People show me how to live. They don't tell me how to live. And so just before I walked back in the hospital room, Jay got on the phone again. And he said, hey, man, you've always wanted to be the world's greatest lover. Now's your chance. And uh, I don't know what I would have done without that conversation, man. I mean, it's, and I don't, I'm not, um, my life does not suck. I don't think about it. I live it. You know, Pip and I, the way we ended up with a fourth child is uh, I got transferred to, to Seattle uh, six years ago and the kids were a bad time to move them. I don't know if I'd do it again, but I needed to feed everyone. And we went up there and, and my daughter started hanging out with this kid and, we loved her. Her name was Abby and, and her name is Abby. And she, you know, she was being raised by wolves. And my wife said over and over, you have to do something about this. And, and you know, I had, I was trying to get my kids to the goalposts, you know, not addicted, not pregnant and educated. And, and I'm working hard and trying to take care of Pip. And I did not want to adopt a child. And one night she sent her little a arrow into my AA bubble and said, you sure like to talk about principles, don't you? And I knew that I was going to wake up and figure out how to adopt that kid because <laughs> mm -hmm. that's how we're supposed to live. And it was sadly easy. Took a couple of court dates and uh, now we have four. Ah, oh, beautiful. Wow. Okay, I am uh, just flabbergasted kind of listening to you. And um, you have a real story uh, in sobriety of miracles that have come true. Uh, what's the line that says, uh, are these extravagant promises? <laughs> yeah, we think, we think not. not. They are being fulfilled. They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. And uh, you've had both, both varieties there. So before we wrap this up, Mr. Matthew, is there anything that you want to say to the listeners out there regarding the steps, regarding your life, regarding anything that you may want people to know? throughout the four corners of this earth regarding Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. Thank you, John. And thank you for these two conversations. Um, yes. There's nothing wrong. Nothing is wrong right now in your life. You, uh, I have spent much time experiencing very high highs and very low lows. And what Alcoholics Anonymous did for me is it made me realize that my happiness should not be dependent on my circumstances. 
my happiness should be dependent on the functioning, my functioning in the world as a channel for a power greater than myself. And I want to say this and I'll stop. <clears throat> I surrendered so many times to alcohol and other things when I swore I wasn't going to do them, when I didn't want to do them, when I could see the downside that was going to happen the second I started again. And I would try to hide from it. I try to hide from the thought. I try to keep people from giving me it. And I would surrender over and over and over to it. And when there's life gives you problems, people die, people get hurt, you lose a job. And suffering is something you can choose to make out of your problems. You can say this shouldn't happen. You can make it worse. You can throw a tantrum. You can not accept your responsibilities. So when I drank alcohol and surrendered, my problems became a magnitude of, of suffering. And now for 27 years, haltingly, I have surrendered to the higher power. Now, I don't care if you believe in Jesus Christ or, or Muhammad or I don't really care. I think it's one God. And don't call it your higher power. It's a higher power. <laughs> you can't you can't have it. You didn't get it on Amazon. It's a higher <laughs> power. It's by definition, you can't bottle it. But I surrender now to this higher power. And it looks different all the time. Sometimes that means being patient with my wife. Sometimes it means not saying something. Sometimes it means going to the jail panel when I don't want to go. And as I've surrendered to this higher power in troubles and in no troubles, my problems have become ladders to new vistas. And I wouldn't wish what happened to my wife on anyone. And I wouldn't wish what Abby went through as a kid on anyone. But I can tell you, in the moment with them, Everything is always perfect. It's always perfect. God is trying to get your attention to show you that. And if you want to find out how that works, I have 12 suggestions. Thanks, Love John. it. Love it. Thank you so much. My pleasure. God bless you. We're God both kind of you. doing little namaste hands <laughs> to each other right now. People can't see that. But uh, I am uh, I'm just truly grateful for the time we've been able to spend together here today, Mr. Matthew. It's just uh, absolutely fantastic. God bless you. God bless you. And God bless your family. Uh, and uh, I hope that our paths do cross sometime very soon. Thank you. I would again. love that, John. I hope so, too. Thanks. Be well. Mr. Matthew M., you can't see it right now, but my hands are in a prayer hands or namaste hands. And I am here saying thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for everything that you've given to the Sober Speak listeners. It is so much appreciated. And as you know, we have more time scheduled with you to talk about some additional subjects, but I so much enjoyed meeting you. You're such a wonderful spirit. God bless you, my friend. And I look forward to doing some additional episodes with you and continuing our friendship as well. If you're out there and you're listening to this and you enjoyed that episode or that episode resonated with you in some form or fashion, Please take a moment to pause your device and share that with a friend and or family member. It may be just what they need today. Remember now, we don't want you sharing your gossip or your STD, but we do want you sharing this episode. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to have to quit doing that one. I'm trying to see, you know, I just try things every once in a while, see how it goes. Now, well, before we go on to a little listener feedback, I do want to tell you that if you happen to not be a member of the super secret Facebook group out here for Sober Speak, send me your email associated with your Facebook account to John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com, and we will get you promptly invited to that super secret Facebook group. Or if you don't want to be in the Facebook group, but you just want to be on the email list, just go ahead and send me your email to the same address, John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com. Now, on to a little bit of listener day la feedback. Susan writes in, and she says, John, 
I have found your podcast to be very helpful during this coronavirus. I have been sober a little over 14 months now. Wow, I can't even imagine getting sober in the middle of this pandemic, but I know people are. By the way, I've been able to attend in-person meetings lately. It is a breath of fresh air, and oh my goodness, to see newcomers and talk to newcomers and be with them. Oh, it's just like a a, a breath of life inside in, in me. And uh, oh, you know, it's just not only what I live for, but many people live for. Anyway, getting back to Susan, my apologies. The thing, Susan says, I like about all of your podcasts is that I can usually find a podcast for whatever issue I may be dealing with at any given time. Most recently, while listening to Reno John talk about when he finally turned it over to God and that he found a place to live, a car, and a job, the pieces just started falling into place. This really made sense to me emotionally for some reason. Since I listened to the episode, I have changed the way I pray each morning. Oh, wow, Susan. With more sincerity and more of a conversation with God instead of just rattling off prayers. The opportunity for an amends I needed to make present, presented itself in a way that I have been praying for. I feel much lighter now. I could go on and on about the episodes that resonated with me. They have all been great. Thank you so much for what you are doing. Please add me, John, to the Super Secret Facebook page. I am under such and such on Facebook. And my associated email is such and such blessings, Susan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. And as you know, I pass that information on to John or to Reno John. Um, and I tell you the speakers, uh, if y'all want to write in something to, that I can, uh, uh, pass on to the speakers, it just means the world to me, uh, when I can pass on good thoughts and good vibes and, and, uh, and, and your comments to them. And I know, I know it means the world to them. Kim writes in and, uh, she says, TP. Oh, oh. Oh, I forgot. TP in the subject line. No, not toilet paper. No, not toilet paper at all. I'm getting to what she means by TP. Kim says, okay, John, I listened to episode 77 this morning with Sue S. in Massachusetts. M-A-S-S-A-C-H-U-S-E-T-T-S. Massachusetts. Anyway, she didn't spell it out. I just, for whatever reason, felt the need to stop and spell out the word Massachusetts. Uh, let's go with Mississippi while I'm at it. Mississippi, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. I think I got that. Nonetheless, let me start over. Kim S. writes in and she says, okay, I listened to episode 77 this morning, Sue S. in Massachusetts. And in your, quote, pregame show, <laughs> my <laughs> she's she's... <laughs> I've never heard it called that before. She's she's talking about when I do an, an introduction. You said the magic words that make me know for a fact you and I would be friends in real life. The big clincher, Tom Petty in all capital letters. Yes, I am a Tom Petty fan, a TP fan. Toilet paper, I could live with or without. No, you know what? That's really not true. Um, ooh, if I had to eliminate one of the TPs in my life, which what do I what I want to eliminate? I, I really don't want to ponder that. That's just too tough a choice. Anyway, she says, sigh. Where to begin in expressing my love for Tom Petty, question mark. From breakdown to ch break down, go ahead and go down. Break down, break down. Anyway, to change of heart to the last DJ, I can't get enough of that man. My mom bought me tickets to his concert for my 16th birthday in 1982, and I saw him every time I could after that. I'm so glad you appreciate the man I refer to as, quote, my my make-believe husband, unquote. 
<laughs> By the way, my real life husband is okay with this, as I didn't know him until after I'd already fallen in love with Tom. <laughs> Laugh out loud. Rock on, TP. I'm doing the the you know the rock and roll uh, horn signs with my. Uh, 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 hands right now. Anyway, you've got good taste in music, John M. Kim M. Well, thank you, Kim M., for writing on, and thank you. I'm glad that there are, I know we're not the only ones, but I sort of say I'm glad there are other TP, Tom Petty fans. I'm sure there are toilet paper fans as well, but I'm glad there are other uh, Tom Petty fans out there in the universe. Mary Pat V, Mary Pat's the first name. Uh, v is the last initial. Mary Pat V writes in and she says, Hi, John. Wanted to let you know that your podcast gives me hope. I appreciate that you pray for your listeners, even though you don't have a name or face for any of us. And I was doing that last night, Miss Mary Pat V. Um, I have a name and face for some of you. But you're right. Uh, I see how many downloads I get. Comparatively speaking, it is uh, relatively none of you. Anyway, she says, I recently started participating in virtual Al-Anon meetings because I have because I have to believe that if AA helps alcoholics, then Al-Anon can help me, the mom of an alcoholic daughter. I came across the Al-Anon podcast, The Recovery Show, while searching desperately for anything that would make me feel better. I'm open to God speaking to me through any means that He can give me directions. I'd like to join the Super Secret Facebook group. Uh, here's my email. Thank you for what you do for others. Mary Pat V. Well, it sounds like a difficult time you may be going through, Mary Pat, but I'm so glad that we here at Sober Speak can be part of that journey with you. Bruce writes in and Bruce says, Bruce, I, by the way, I'm also a Bruce Springsteen fan. Uh, you know, and when they come out on stage and everybody goes, Bruce. Uh, this is uh, this is my version of cheering for somebody named Bruce uh, who's writing into the podcast. Bruce, anyway, Bruce says uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm new here, working on sobriety. I have been listening for a week and have encountered a critique of your humor. <laughs> I'm not sure. And I have encountered a critique of your humor and that of others like Reno John. I have found that humor is the most powerful tool in education and is a true joy and road to revelation. Not the humor or an aside, but integrated with the subject. Well, I'm going to have a little bit of a tough time understanding that fully, Bruce, but I think you're saying that you like humor. And uh, I, yeah, it's, I guess this could, debate, it could be debated whether we deliver that. I know some of the guests do. Like you just talked about Reno John. That guy is hilarious. And, you know, I should have I should have like a... a, a if I could do this, I don't know how I would do that. Like, like if you put a humor rating next to the, uh, next to the, uh, the, to the episodes, but you know, some aren't very, they have no humor in them at all. And that's a good thing. But some of them like Reno, John, and some of the other, some of the Bill C things that he does. Uh, I mean, they, they just crack me up. Andrew, uh, he cracks me up. Anyway, there, there's several of them, but I don't really know how I could put a humor rating next to any of them. But nonetheless, Bruce, I'm so glad that you wrote in. I really appreciate it. Patty writes in and Patty says, please add me. A lot of people want to get in the super secret Facebook group lately. Please add, please invite me to the super secret Facebook group. I love your work. Well, thank you, Patty. Keep it up. You are helping me and so many others. I have a food addiction and I'm the daughter of alcoholic parents. I also have an adult son in active addiction and my husband is a recovering addict. Oh gosh, there are so many of us who need your help. You and your guest are a blessing. Sincerely, Patty S. Well, Patty S., you are a blessing. You really are. And uh, once again, I am glad we can be part of your journey with you as well. It sounds like you got several things going on there. And you know what? Here's the deal. 
I've been doing this a long time. And I have noticed that whenever I talk to a friend and or a family member, once you open up about your particular, let me put it this way. Once I have opened up about my journey in recovery, it never fails, uh, never fails. There, there is somebody there saying, well, let me tell you about my cousin, or let me tell you about my spouse, or let me tell you about my children, or sometimes in a roundabout way, they'll go, well, how do you actually know you're an alcoholic or an addict? And, you know, sometimes they're trying to figure it out for themselves, as you know. And so it is all around us. There is nobody on this planet uh, in my estimate, well, I should I shouldn't say nobody on this planet, but I would say the vast majority of people have been impacted by uh, alcoholism and or addiction. And nonetheless, Patty, I'm sure glad you wrote in. Stephen writes in. And Stephen says, "Hey, John, I just started listening to your podcast, Sober Speak, and I wanted to be added to the Facebook group." Sober Speak has going was told to me that you email to you to just add me in. Is the group still alive? Love the podcast. Keep up the awesome work. God bless Stephen. Stephen, is the group still alive? Are you kidding me? It is just booming with activity. <laughs> We're going to have to, I heard uh, Dave say in the group one day, and this was back really in the beginning, I think it got up to like 100 people or 200 people or whatever. It was actually very small compared to what it is at the time, to compared to what it is now. And Dave said, you're going to have to rent out some more space, John. So... <laughs> Uh, we're going to have to rent out some more space for Steven and the rest of you. But yes, the group is very much still alive and kicking. Rob writes in Rob says, John, I'm 32 years old from New Jersey. I was born into a family with addiction and alcoholism on both sides. My father left when I was 11 and I was in and out of my, and he was in and out of my life until the age of 16. As someone from a poor family, single mother raised, hey, I can relate to there, Mr. Rob. I never had much money and have struggled with a bipolar depression and anxiety. After years of failed medic medication and a mental rehabilitation stays. I have found alcohol. I found alcohol and started drinking. I spent many years par partying, just thinking it was a phase and I would outgrow it. But many series of events in my life would play out from moving and almost being on the streets uh, from a foreclosed home to having many problems, keeping a steady job, mental health tr troubles, relationship failures, and most important, great confidence issues, insecurities, and many years on and off and alone for extended years of time. I would turn to alcohol and more. My alcoholism reached its peak the last year uh, when my partner was dealing with my drunken behavior on and off for the past 13 months in March, I started to begin tr trying to quit drinking, but never understood just how important AA and the resources were out there to be in successful recovery. I wanted a life with her, that partner more than anything. I ultimately could not cope with her decision to leave. And, and I did. And did, oh, and she did once what I had, had done after all those initial 48 days. This time, there would have to be 42 days, 90 total, plus two slips, ups and relapses. And I ended up on the streets until 4 a.m., where I was able to cough up enough money to find a cheap hotel rate. I had hit rock bottom. I related to yourself and Adam T, that's another episode, discussing the act of providence. That was the turning point and moment in which I became all in and am now more serious and committed to this life of sobriety than ever before. And I hope to one day get the love of my life back as the result of my successful story. I am looking into any help that I can find. 
I'm waiting for my lift back to my mother's house as she has agreed to let me back here for what is my last chance to get sober or I'll be homeless. I found your podcast and shows, Adam T., as my first listen. You have both changed my life and my way of thinking, and I'm eternally grateful. You've helped me to take my first step. Today is my sobriety date, and I am very committed. I really hope to change my life and to turn that around and help others once I'm able to help myself, Rob. God bless you, Rob. You know, it doesn't get old. Um, Getting letters and emails, I should say, <laughs> letters, emails like that nowadays, um, I, I, I just, it, it warms my heart and I'm so able that me and people like Adam um, can help people in their journey. Uh, and, and I know we're just a very, very small part of their journey. Gosh, but if, if some word or some, some uh, episode that, that, that we've put out there can help anyone out there at any time. Um, I just feel like I'm, I'm doing my job here on this earth and, and I'm so, I'm so happy for you, Rob and keep, keep up the good fight, my friend, and keep me posted. Urban writes in urban. Urban says, I'm thinking about urban. Isn't like urban, uh, like a, like a store out there? Like, oh no, uh, urban outfitters. Is that what it's called? But nonetheless, I doubt this is the guy who owns urban outfitters, but eh, here we go. Hi, John. Excuse me for the spelling. Sober speak. Uh, I, I speak better English than I spell. I'm a Swedish alcoholic. He lets them, some thin. Hello, you sweetest alcoholic. My sobriety date is 1st of April, 1998. I came into the rooms of AA on the 13th of December, 1990. The only reason at the time I was able to stop drinking is because I didn't want to change and I didn't believe in a higher power. In fact, I was a convinced atheist. In October, 2011, I became a member of the Swedish Bar Association for attorneys and lawyers, the Swedish Bar Association for attorneys and lawyers. I wonder if when they have those meetings, they sit around eating uh, Swedish fish. <laughs> My kids used to eat those all the time. I wonder if those really have anything to do with Sweden. I wonder if people in Sweden even know anything about Swedish fish, to tell you the truth. But anyway... To become a member there, one needs to first graduate from law school for four to five years, work as a lawyer for three years, and at the time it was five years, do exams, and then apply for becoming a member of the Bar Association. Slowly, it took a few years, I left my daily program according to the big year, to, to the big book. My year one was me being a lawyer. Slowly, I started picking up other addictions, work, sex, love, but I didn't drink. So last year in May, I felt a total spiritual and emotional void. I went to SLAA, but were well, I was also in AA. To make it short, to make it a short story, I think he means, it all took me back to the steps, the program. I got a sponsor, worked the steps according to the big book. I've had the same daily program today as I used to have in the first 10 years. I worked through the steps again, got a new sponsor a few days ago in AA, and I have a strict daily routine. I start making my bed, I read some texts, I pray, I meditate, I try Try to live in the ten through tw in steps ten through twelve. I took on a sponsee. I pray. I pray during the day and in the evening, and I thank God for the day He has given me. At the end of the day, my old daily program is slowly coming back. I work nine to five now, and I have become more efficient than before. No workaholic hours. I have attended Dallas noon meetings on Zoom since the 20th of May almost every evening. And so I met Julie and John. Both Julie W. and John W. have been on this podcast, Mr. Uh, Urban. I'm sure you know that. 
And that is how I found Sober Speak. By the way, it's a great podcast, Sober Speak. This is a short summary of my way into sobriety. God bless you, John Urban. Now I've got to get back to running Urban Outfitters. I'm just kidding. He didn't say that. I completely made that up. Well, Mr. Urban from Steeden. Thank you so much for writing in. I appreciate it. And it sounds like you are back on track. Please give John and Julie my best when you run into them, please. Finally, folks, I think that's finally. Yes. Last but not least, George writes in. He says, hi, John. I am from central Minnesota. I am relatively new to AA and the steps, but I enjoy feeling good every day. And I look forward to the processes of the steps leading to a place of contentment. I have searched for a bit and probably tried six to eight different podcasts. Yours is the best and frankly levels above the rest. Well, thank you, George. You consistently have good speakers. Well, I will attest to that. He says, Bill C is extraordinary. I like Gary K as well and several others. Thank you again. I look forward to listening to the rest of the speakers. Best to you and your family, George. Well, likewise, Mr. George, best to you, your family, and friends as well. And by the way, I have more episodes coming up with Bill C. And I have more episodes, or I should say, I have at least one in the can with Bill C. And another one in the can with Gary K. And uh, Gary K. is actually scheduled for a live event uh, that we're going to be doing at the end of the year in uh, December. And you know, we originally scheduled that uh, to be live, like in person live uh, here uh, in the Frisco, Texas area. But I don't know exactly where we're going to be in uh, December. So we're taking it one day at a time. With that being said, folks, that's another week in the books. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. Love y'all. Thank you once again for uh, listening in. And I will most likely be back next week. God bless you.